The early church was made up of small congregations. You know that, I suppose. Huh? They moved in homes and so forth. And they had an intimacy that we do not have today. I'm not just talking about Adventists. I've been in other churches. I've been in other denominations. It's not just an Adventist issue. I want you to go to an airport, look around, and what about 50% of the people are doing? They're on their cell phone. They're communicating electronically. Okay, if I have another Zoom or WebEx meeting, I'm going somewhere else. <laughs> it's not the same, right? It's not the same. And so we live in a world of detachment today. How many people, and we look at ourselves, how well do you know your next door neighbor? How well do you know the guy down the street about a block? We do not communicate anymore. We're not comfortable with that. We get home from work, what do we want to do? Close the blind, shut the door, and I just want to relax. I know, I felt that way. You know, I'm in marketing and sales. Did you know that marketing and sales people are introverts? <laughs> That's true. They see people all day long. What do you think they don't want to do when they get home? Right? Wife's usually an exception. And so forth. Yeah. Yes, yes. It really comes down to the fact that we live in an age of not communicating, and it truly shows it, okay, and so forth. And I hate to think what this pandemic will do when we have our young people out of school. They're not associated. What are they doing? Okay, and so forth. And I mean, the ramifications of what we went through over the last few months are lasting. may affect a whole generation, and so forth. So... Jesus was a communicator, and so forth. He's probably thankful he didn't have cell phones, and he didn't have computers, and all of those other things, and so forth. So we already have, it shows you how strong culture is on the church. Anybody believe that culture doesn't have an effect on the church? What do you think the reason is that the Assyrians invaded Israel and the Babylonian Judea? What was the major issue with those people? On both sides of the fence, culture. Culture infiltrated their church, those people. And so when we say, well, we're not like those people, I beg to differ. We're very much like those people. What's that? Ooh. Should I say? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we'll go back to our slides. Believe it or not, I have them. You know, uh, the, the reason the pastor, I don't know if you used slides last week. The reason is because I took the remote home. Oh. <laughs> he, I guess what that means is uh, when the pastor's angry at you, uh, you have to watch the sermon out in the foyer uh, and so forth. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. So anyway, I, I promise not to do that next time. Let's see. See, this is what happens when you, huh? So you're saying it's the user's problem, right? I see. It's a user issue. All right, all right, all right, all right. What's going on? What have I done? There we go. Hey, I know, it's not doing anything. Hey, whatever I did. Why is it not working? Come on, Robert. Can't be the user. been vindicated. All right, well, he's playing with that. Let's go on a little bit. Okay, so you think it'll work now? 
Am I all right to use this? I know Tim's saying, forget those slides. <laughs> right? That's why I don't use them. <laughs> all right. All right, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Next slide. We took that already. Let's go to the next one and the next one. Okay, let's go through this. Our next point is an interesting story about an attorney who comes to Jesus and asks him a very important question. What must I do that I might have eternal life? This is a man who was well-skilled and knowledgeable of the Jewish faith, and so forth. And there's a lot of reasons why he might have asked that question. One, he might be asking that question because, by, by the way, he was a religious man. Okay? Some might say he was a God-fearing man. But the point is, he was not satisfied with his faith. He was not satisfied with his religion. I wonder... Have you ever gotten into that position or been in that position where you felt a lack of satisfaction about where you were or where you are? How many have ever thought of walking away from the church? Even once. Has there ever been a time in your life, young, old, middle-aged, whatever? Tim, okay. Appreciate your honesty. All right. Anybody? Okay. I'll raise my hand. It happened one time, but uh, fortunately, uh, it was short-lived, and so forth. And so this man comes to Jesus, and let's kind of read it together. He asked him, teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Good question. Jesus says, well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? That's why we ought to, is that the way you approach an attorney? Yeah, right? He's got some ego here. Well, what do you think? That always works, doesn't it? If somebody asks you a question you can't answer or you don't want to answer, or you would prefer to see where he's coming from, re turn the question back on him, right? Let them refer to it or answer it. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. What do you read about this guy from that answer? What does that tell you about him? He's got the answers. What answer would you probably expect from him based upon his background that we know of? Keep the commandments. I wonder if we would ask an Adventist on the street and say, hey, what must I do to keep eternal life? What would he say? What would she say? What would we have said? Okay. He gave a good answer, did he not? Yeah. If you have that, you have everything. I, I think I know where you're going with this, but I would I, I think most people would traditionally say, oh, they'd say, you know, you got to keep the Sabbath or this kind of thing. I don't think most Adventists would say something like that. I not think, today. Think, yeah. Not today. Yeah. answer, but what do their actions say? How, what, do you, what does their interaction teach? That speaks a lot louder than having it does. And I want, to, I want you to hold that response what Mark just stated because we're going to skip over to get to where, you, where you're at and so forth because there's a key about love, okay? Because when we state, you know, well, we must keep the commandments. Well, obviously, it is commandment keeping within the fold of the Christian faith but it's where it's at. It's not the necessarily the initiator of love. Yes? Yeah. Okay, that's right. 
All right, so Jesus said, you've spoken truth here. You've spoken correctly. Do this, and you will live. Well, then he comes back, and the Bible says, in essence, without reading the text, you know, he asks the question, well, who is my neighbor? And it says in the Bible, he said that to justify himself. Anybody want to give a shot at that one? Huh? What was he trying to justify? His own actions, right? Now, we know this is going to get into the story of the Samaritan and the priest and the Levite. But probably in his own mind, he felt he was taking care of his neighbor because of how he defined it. For the Jew, come talk to a Jew in those days and say, well, you know, you're not really friendly with the Samaritans. He said, well, that's the way God would want it. That's okay. That's not a problem. Now, we might laugh at that. But there are times when Christians believe the same thing about different races, about gender, and so forth. The church. I want to tell you a story. And it's meant so much to me, and I hope you take it the right way. I was a uh, general manager for a company called MetPath. They were a large, the largest clinical laboratory company in, uh, in the United States. And we hired uh, salespeople, of course, to sell lab services to physicians and hospitals and so forth. And I hired a black man named Bill. Bill was sharp. He was bright. He had a background in medical technology. He knew his stuff. He had great personality. I interviewed him. It wasn't even a question. We needed him. So one day, Bill calls me up and says, Hey, Chuck, would you mind coming down with me and help me with a situation I have at a hospital? And I said, Bill, I'm going happy to. I, so we arranged a time when I could get down there. So we drove down south of St. Louis. I won't mention the town. We were in, well, maybe it was an hour, hour and a half drive. We went into this hospital. And we walked in there. And the lab director comes out, and he looks at me, and he looks at Bill. And he looks at Bill, and he said, Boy, you know, we have you know, some certain restrictions here and so forth. And he said, Did you make an appointment? And he went, on with his dialogue, but all the way through that conversation, he kept calling Bill Boy, and the red in my neck, you know how that goes, stood inching up all the way. I looked over at Bill. Bill was calm. He was polite, and so forth, and I was watching him. And so for a minute, the um, guy walked out to get some paper, and I looked over at Bill, and I said, Bill, you don't need, I mean, you don't have to take this. We'll walk out right now. And he said, no, Chuck, it's okay. I can deal with it. So the guy came back, and we asked him before we left. We said, we'd like to eat, it, eat somewhere. You've got a nice restaurant here in town. You know what he said? I would suggest 120 miles north. So when I walked out, I sat down with Bill. I said, I really apologize for that. He said, Chuck, you don't need to apologize. He said, that man was raised that way. He didn't know anything else. And he said, you know what? I pray that someday, by my actions, I'll win his favor. I looked at the, I've never forgotten that story. I said, Bill, I can't believe that. I didn't want Bill to feel like he was a, a mat so people could walk all over him. But Bill's idea was revenge never works, that we need to love people. And what a living example that was. I've never forgotten it. It's had a great impression on me. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe you have stories of other situations and so forth that have impressed you. So Jesus goes on with his story. And uh, if you want to go to the last slide. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Go two more slides. Uh, okay, leave it there. Let's finish the story, the parable. A man goes down from, goes up from Jerusalem and he is beaten and robbed stripped of his clothes, beat badly, money is taken, and he's a Jew, and he's laying on the road. The leader of the church comes walking by, and he slips over to the other side, and he's got to preach in about 30 minutes, so he didn't have a lot of time, so he slips on by. And then later, one of the elders of the church walks by, and we call him a Levite here, and he does the same thing. 
Although he stops and takes a good look. And then he goes. And then comes one of those nasty Samaritans. One of those people we don't deal with, right? Not Samaritans. What does he do? He stops. He helps the man, gets him on his donkey, he takes him to the Four Seasons Hotel, takes him in, takes him to his room, spends a day with him to help him get healed. He, next day, he has a business appointment. He has to leave. He goes up to the register and he says, hey, look, here's to deny. Take this, and I'll be back in a week. If there's other expenses, I will pay for them. Keep an eye on him. And so Jesus looks at the man, and he said, which of the three would you say was his neighbor? And he said, well, the Samaritan. Did he say that? He didn't. Why? Why do you think he didn't mention the Samaritan? certainly was foremost on his mind. He said, the one who helped him. Jesus said, go and do likewise, right? He was so built into bias and prejudice, he couldn't even give credit to the person who did it, right? Uh, and so forth. But we're Christians. We have a different outlook on life. We believe that all people God loves and risks his life for. Is that not true? and gave his life. So the second part is not only do we need more dialogue, what we do need is that we look at all people as brothers and sisters and we treat them accordingly. Everybody agree? How's the church doing in that area? Now when we mention the church, we're not only talking about the hierarchy and the leaders, but we're talking also about the brethren. Do we need work in this area, or are we there? What do you think? We need work. I, I don't use Facebook. I don't use social media, but um, I've seen some admirals really rip into people through this war last year regarding politics and, and, and big things. That I, could, I mean, I know these people, pastors, they can preach them from the pulpit on hate and, uh, and just division. Yeah. Do we need more bills in our congregation, would you say? What do you think? There isn't one of us that possibly hasn't had some prejudice or bias, maybe because of our economy, maybe because of the job that we perform. Um, who knows? Our economic levels, that type of thing. There's all kinds of bias and prejudice. Sure we are. So we're right at the door. He's about to come. And he's going to close probation. And your last breath is your probation. Close. So why do we do it? Our only purpose here is to love people, bring them in for a season, set the tone. Everything else is going to burn up and go away. And we're focused okay. on this instead of on each other salvation. Ah, you have laid the groundwork for the next step. I handed her my notes before we started this morning. She's following it right on schedule. Appreciate your comments and so forth. We want to come back to that. And Mark, yours too. So if you could, next slide. Uh, all right, let's go on. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is taken from Christ's Object Lessons. We've got a number of topics from different authors and I want to share with you and get your opinions on. Love is the basis of godliness. And nobody disagrees. Sometimes we wonder, even by our own comments at times. All right? Whatever the profession, no man has pure love to God unless he has an unselfish love for his brother. I saw that in Bill under very adverse circumstances. I was impressed, obviously. It shows you when we act out in love, what impression that has on people. They're really impressed with that. That's not a worldly approach. That's a godly approach. What a guy. Huh? 
But we can never come into possession of the Spirit by trying to what? Love others. It's not possible. So now I got a dilemma. We need to love others. But within my own humanity, I have it's not going to happen. So when we sit down and say, I've got to work hard on trying to love people. Is that going to work? I told this story. Bob, you heard this story. Bob should probably tell this. We did this in Sabbath school. And uh, we was at Camelback. We had a fairly large class, about 28. And we were talking about this very subject, love and forgiveness. And we had this man. He was probably in his 40s. And uh, he... Uh, we were really, as I said, we was a larger group, but we were pretty free in our discussions. We felt comfortable with one another. And he gets up, and I could see his face was red as red. Well, he said there was this pastor in Loma Linda. I'll tell you what he is. And he said, he's a, and I have not the proper place to say it. You could have heard a pin drop. One of my members said, Larry, why don't you tell us how you really feel? What he was saying is he had harbored this anger. Whatever this pastor did, he had not forgotten. And he was carrying the burden of anger all this time. I Maybe you and I can look at one another and say, is there anybody that we really don't like? Is there anybody we really don't like? Is there someone we wouldn't stand to be around? Somebody we wouldn't want to go to lunch with? But think about that. Of all the faults that I have, I can't think of one. Well, mother maybe, but that's, we'll get that settled. But uh, no, I can't. I can't think of one. That doesn't make me look so great and so on. I just can't think of anybody. Maybe there's somebody, but I can't think of them. And so forth. So let's go on to this. What is needed is the love of Christ in the heart. What does that take us back to? The very foundation of our faith, does it not? When we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, and we've talked about all the gifts that he gives us when that transpires, and one of them is the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's presence within our life, a power to offset your carnal nature, which you do not lose at conversion. It stays. So God says, well, I got an answer for that. We'll give you another power to contest it, right? So, what is needed is a love. When self is merged in Christ, love springs forth. Oh, Moy Venden used this next word, and he was condemned for that many times. How many have heard Moy Venden? Read his books. You know, he was a student of Heppenstall, who basically helped us with a, even a better understanding of righteous by faith in the church. That's why you don't hear testimonies a lot. Well, I kept the Sabbath. I accepted it in 1842. No, you hear testimonies like, when I found Jesus, I found what it was like to have his presence with me in life, to walk through me in difficult times, and the good ones as well. And so, spontaneously, most of anyone said, if you stay close to Christ, if you stay with him, walk with him, pray to him, study his word, study to not to know him, not just to study to study. Then, as Jesus said in John 15, that we use so often when the branch is attached to the vine, Jesus said, you'll produce fruit because I'll produce it. You don't produce fruit. I produce it. I'm only asking you to stay what? Attached. So let's answer your question. Probation is closed. So Jesus is coming and so forth. The solution still the same, is a daily walk with Jesus. I hope someday that we'll institute testimonies in our church. We need to do that. Maybe you've even found it within yourself. When we stop doing the testimonies, uh, we stop testifying outside of its boundaries. We need to learn to testify, to give a testimony. It makes us think, if I was to give up and give a testimony today, could I make a talk or a discussion about a recent event in my life. Maybe it was just where well, I saw God's intervention in my life. Can we say that? 
When I was at the Evangelical United Brethren Church, I was just a teenager. I was there because my wife was there. She was, I was dating her. It was either that or the, I wasn't dating. I had to go there. She even took me to youth for Christ when I wanted to go to a movie. I mean, how bad is that? <laughs> well, I'm thankful she did. But they had, the, they had testimonies just about every meeting. And we kept them to a minimum. Not everybody gave a test. Sometimes you feel like it, sometimes you don't. That's okay. And most of the testimonies I heard, they would stand up and say, you know, Jesus was with me yesterday, and I'll tell you why. That has meaning to me. And it had meaning then as a teenager. And so, as it says here, as we get closer and closer to Jesus, spontaneously we'll act like Bill. Spontaneously we'll be seeing Jesus in our life, right? The problem is it takes patience. Here is the patience of the saints. Faith and trust takes time. You say, well, is that the case? What about the thief on the cross? He had enough when he was laying there naked on that cross. Well, he could have been angry, upset, and the other one was. And he looked at his life. He saw how bad it was. He was impressed by Jesus, as so many were. And all he could say is, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus do? Well, let's see here. Let's see. Uh, see, We're not in 1844 yet, so let's see here. I don't know. Uh, let's see. You know, you kind of, the scale doesn't look too good on your side. What did he really say? He did not hesitate. He said, I tell you this today, comma, you will be with me where? In paradise. Know what he said? And so forth. There is hope in that message. You know, we can be sitting here in church as, as low as we could ever be. And when we preach this message of hope, even as despairing as we might be, there's still a chance for you. And there's still a chance for me. Jesus didn't come here to kill or destroy us. He tried to tell his disciples when they wanted fire to come down on the Samaritans. He said, I came here to save people. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not willing that any should perish. Is that his attitude? It is, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful? It's great. All right, next slide. Okay. As Christians, as ones who have received the gift of salvation, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of repentance, becoming a member of the family of God, when you accept Jesus, you are a family member. It's just that simple, right? So it says, once you're in that category, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. It gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your sh light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. And we always stop there. And our good deeds must do something. Glorify God. Now, sometimes we might look back and say, you know, this really happened. It was really, I'm really thankful. But we don't finish it. I'm thankful because God made it happen. If people don't hear that part, what's missing? The whole idea of it happening. This is the problem with the social gospel. I should say a, what we call the social, where we give food to people. That's fine. That's good. Jesus did that. We help people who are sick. But let's give credit to the one who's responsible for doing it, right? If we don't, we lose the message. There are a lot of people who are deep in sin who are very benevolent people. Did you know that? Give lots of money to the poor. Do all kinds of things. But they're not Christians. And so, we want to do it the right way. So how do we hide from others, the light God has given us. Next slide. We'll just take up some real points because we don't have a lot of time. All right, here we go. Uh, we're starting to get personal now. So uh, honesty is foremost. <laughs> so a bunch of comments and something. First one. One way that we highlight is being quiet when we should speak. Come on now. How many of you have done something, you've had a conversation with someone, you've had dialogue, and you thought, well, it was good, but something came up and I didn't speak. Have you ever been there? And you felt horrible. You missed an opportunity, right? 
and so forth. Why is it that we sometimes refrain from saying something when we know we should? We know the Holy Spirit, we know it's that. We know because it comes to our mind. And we say, yeah, don't say it. Why would that be? Okay, yeah. How's that going to affect what they think of me? Political. Okay. Ashamed? I hate to use that word. I don't want Jesus to be ashamed of me when he comes. And we don't want to be ashamed of him. So sometimes we have it. How can we get beyond that? How can we improve in that area? Okay. Now, don't you think, though, most of us know that when that thought comes to our mind? We know what we should do. As uh, one of our well-noted evangelists from many years ago, he said, I'm not so worried about what I don't do, but what I do do, and I should know better, and so forth. There is a power to, to witness, is there not? There's a power beyond ourselves. Yes. All right. Okay. You're making reference to a text of the old tip. There's a time to speak and there's a time to be silent. So the question is, how do I recognize the Holy Spirit speaking? That is really critical. Bob? Okay. Okay, and I and I is important. It is important. We say, that is the key. Being in relationship and spending time and taking time with him. I'll go back to you and then we'll finish that. Go ahead. Yeah. I think if we were a class and we've been meeting together for a year or so, I think our conversation would even be more enlightening because we'd be even more honest about, I have this issue. It's okay. We'll deal with it. We need to deal with it another. You know, Hebrews uh, 8, verse 25 says, the closer we get to the end, the more we should be together. We need one another. No one's here better than someone else. But as you mentioned, someone mentioned here about the dialogue. Bob, maybe you mentioned that. The dialogue of what you hear from someone else is something you had thought about. People can be encouraging. We need that. I need encouraging. You need it. We have times of depression. We have times of fear. We have times of all kinds of things. The church is a refuge for us. That's what it's here for. Isn't that right? Well, God is good. He is a refuge in a time of trouble. How wonderful that is. Nahum 1.7. He cares for those who trust in him. Doesn't mean he doesn't care for everybody, but he means he can really do something for those who trust in him. How many times did people come to Jesus and say, help my unbelief? In other words, I don't have a lot of faith. Jesus reached out. He, he doesn't mind if we keep coming to him and asking for help. That's what he wants us to do. It's when we don't ask. It's when we don't seek. Isn't that where we have our problem? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, 6, all right? All right, how about this one? Going along with the crowd. Oh, I, uh, I, I live in Loma Linda. That's not an issue. I figured I heard somebody laugh. 
when I said that. I live in an environment that I don't have to worry about that. Really? Going along with the crowd. Sometimes even when in our intimate groups, something might be said that maybe is inappropriate or it is not appropriate for the situation or is something that's a problem, needs a correction. When we know people, when we like them, we love them, how we address that will be good, not negative. We can do that and they can feel comfortable. At one time, I had this word I was saying, I don't even remember what it was now, but it was not a good one. It wasn't one of those real bad ones, it was one of those white, you know, what we call white lies? Not a white lie, it was called a, well, you know, it's, it could do better. Poor English, how's that, that better? So this saint came up and she was a lovely person, wonderful. She says, Chuck, can I talk to you for a minute? This is the first warning. <laughs> Not really, I didn't know what she was going to say. So she comes up to him and she says, look, uh, you know, you use this term a lot. I said, yeah. She said, you know, I think it'd be better that you use something else. Now, I could have been offended, but I wasn't because I knew her. I knew she was looking out for me. And she didn't do it to put me down. She said it to help me. So you see, it's hard for us to act as a church when we don't know one another. It's difficult when we're not associating with one another. It's hard to be personable. It's hard to have dialogue, not that right? And so forth. How can we get through this mess? Because it is difficult. I think a lot of people, we talk about millennials, don't want to go to church anymore. And this pandemic may have ramifications we would not like to talk about because people are getting comfortable being at home for worship. That should scare us. And so, how can we get out of this mess? It's too big of a burden for me. I have answers, but I, we need solutions and so forth. And the Bible tells us, continue, you bring it to me. I will deal with this. And if we pray as a congregation, help us to have better dialogue. Lord, lead us into the way that we can have a church that we truly are brothers and sisters. That I don't care what has happened, what something has happened in our life, where well, the world would walk away, well, we will not. We will stand before with our brother and sister, regardless of the situation. Yes. All right. <laughs> Heard that before. <laughs> well, it is. I want to ask you, how many took classes in listening when you were in college? Listening 101, listening 102. Had plenty of speech classes. No wonder we talk all the time, right? When did you take a class in listening? Can you just see that? What are you majoring in? Ah, listening. <laughs> we're not trained to listen. You know, when I, was in, uh, when I was in sales for many years, and sales has changed dramatically. Now, we don't have time to get into that. In fact, we don't. It's 1057. And I don't think we got back to you yet, did we? No? Well, that, Tim will kill you next week. So, right? Remember that, Tim. And so forth. Well, we need to close. Pastor is looking at me and saying, one more minute, and you will be listening to the sermon out in the foyer. And so, pardon? <laughs> Bob said that, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good point. Good point. <laughs> hey, listen, I really appreciate you being here today and uh, the good times that we had discussing God's Word. You know, studying the Bible can be a fun time, can it not? It can be an enjoyable time. So thank you for being here and so forth. And uh, I trust you have a good Sabbath day, that you walk out of here with more confidence, more assurance, and hope for the future. Uh, than you had when you walked in. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you today, we give thanks again. Oh, it's, well, it's good to be with the brethren. Now, we all have our issues. We all have our troubles. We all have our deficiencies. But we know, although we may not be faithful at times, you are always dependable and faithful, and we give thanks for that. Pray that you'll be with each one. For those who are on Facebook, pray you'll be with our church today, that we gain a great experience in knowing you. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much.